This is John Abrams, and this is The Variety Artist, episode 59. If you're building your character or searching for your own character, this is the guy to listen to. He's created characters in all of his magic shows. He has a character in an online comic. He has a character on a board game. He also has a character in a card game. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. The Magic Castle newsletter said, one of the best children's entertainers in the world. Known for his amazing characters and spectacular magical skills, he's one of a kind. Variety Artist, I give you Master Pain. Hey, how's it going? I'm here. Good, good, great, great intro, great intro. I do more than children's magic, though. When I built the web page, that was the best quote I had. Well, you know what's funny is that I watch a lot of your videos, and not a lot of them have children in them. No, because I, I generally don't film my. You have a problem about filming kids' shows. You know, ah. if kids get into the video, and you can't really put that up these days, and. So I don't. I I have reference footage, but I don't have a lot of uh, uh, footage of me doing my my kid stuff. Sure, I run into that too because I do a lot of elementary schools, and I run into that all the time. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about your name. We're going to talk about Renaissance fairs, all sorts of different things. But before we even start, we'll start with something kind of fun. Who was Ramu? Oh, geez, you found that <laughs> Ramu. Okay, so I have a horrible name that no one can pronounce. And you know, being a kid, you wanna you wanna have a, a, a super neat magic sounding name. And so I I struggled and I went and looked far and wide and and I came across a book, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama. Mm -hmm. And I just changed Rama to Ramu. And so I performed as Ramu for the first few years. It was sad, and I, I, I had hoped mostly forgotten, but, but it's the internet, things are forever. That's right. I have to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it, it, it is sad, but yeah, there, uh, fortunately, there, there are no, no uh, there's a few photos, but thankfully, no video. I, this was back in the 70s, so. Where did pain come from? I belong to a medieval recreation group called the Society for Creative Anachronisms, mm -hmm. which most people know what that is nowadays, but when I joined, nobody knew what that was. But it, they, they go out in the woods and they, they, uh, they recreate the Mid Middle Ages as it should have been, which tells you exactly how much they value authenticity. And so when you join the group, you have to come up with a medieval name. Mm -hmm. and I didn't think Ramu would work. Yeah, Ramu! <laughs> I thought I looked hard. I, I just couldn't come up with a name. And then my my mother had gotten this book on genealogy of our one branch of our family. The earliest ancestor they could find was a pain of wood rising. And I went, well, I like that. That's kind of a neat name. So I I chose the name Pain of Wood Rising for my my medieval name. Mm. And I was living in a small town in in central Washington. And I met my my uh, future wife in this organization. So I she lived in Seattle. I moved to Seattle. The only people that knew me were people in the SCA. She knows, only knew me as Payne. And everybody just called me Payne. And I said, I, I, really, I really like this name. This name really suits me a lot better than my, my given name. So when I got married, I changed my middle name from its uh, previous name, which I'm never telling anyone, to <laughs> Payne. Uh, and I dropped the of wood rising. People just you know, sort of call me Payne. So did did you get it legally changed? It's legally changed uh, halfway. I haven't I haven't gone as far as a social security, uh, but it's on my driver's license. So I, I you can have a non diploma on your driver's license. Mm. I haven't gone through the the rigmarole of having it changed, you know. And everyone knows me my my pain. It, you know, my nine to five they call me pain. Oh, so it's you know it's just it's just who I am. I I've, I've completely adopted the name. A friend of mine, um, I'm, you, you probably know him, Buster Balloon. Oh, I love Buster Balloon. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, that obviously is not his real name, but it is what? now. He, oh, my God. I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> shocker, yeah. shocker of all shockers. But he had his name legally changed to Buster Balloon. I have brought this up in other interviews. So when he goes to the airport and he has his passport, and it says right on his passport, Buster Balloon. Yeah. <laughs> People question him. But it's there, you know, you can change your name to anything you want. So how did Master come about, Master Pain? 
in the in the SCA they have what are known as peerages. They're, they're, they have knights who are the fighters who become king and queen and prince and princess of the realm. And then you have a service side and an art side. The service side is called pelicans. The art side is called laurels. And when you're elevated to one of these ranks, you achieve the name of title of master. Mm. So I became Master Payne in the SCA. And one medieval fair I worked at, the gatekeeper just started calling me Master Payne. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. It's medieval. It worked fine. So when I did my debut appearance in 2011 at Magic Live, yeah. Stan says, what, what name do you want on the reader board? Because, you know, they, they, when you do a pre presentation at the breakout sessions, they put your name up on the big, big screens behind you. And I said, pain. And he said, I, I don't want to put a first, just a single name. Mm -hmm. and I'm going, what if I was Teller or Cher or Madonna? <laughs> and they, they wouldn't go for it. So I said, okay, put up master pain which he didn't. He put up major pain, but... Um, <laughs> isn't that, that's a TV show, isn't it? It's a movie. It's a movie. And I, I didn't know that because I, you know, I walked out and faced the audience. I never turned around to look, but then he apologized to me about, we, we blew it. But I, 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 so I got introduced there as Master Pain, and the name just stuck. Everybody knows me as Master Pain. No one ever questions it. No one ever says, you know, you're a bondage or something. It's just... They just sort of accept that, that that's my name and that's what I go by. I've been forever stuck in the magic community from that point forward as, as a master pain. I like it. I, I do too, you know, but, but it, is, it, is, it is an odd name. And, yeah. and then you have that whole problem, I'm a master magician. People get, well, how can you say you're a master magician? I don't say I'm a master magician. I'm a master pain. <laughs> the magic guy, I never say Master wait, wait. I think there's a difference between Master Pain and A Master Pain. A Master Pain or the Master Pain. <laughs> uh, I did a convention. I did international magic in London, and they, they reserved my room for me at the hotel, and they had me, the hotel put me under Mr. Master Pain. <laughs> oh, Mr. Master. <laughs> I'm Mr. Master Pain. So, it's, yeah, you get some amusing, amusing anecdotes out of it from time to time. Now, has that been a problem in any of the conventions and things when you have name tags and things? Well, first checking in, you don't know whether they put you under master or pain. Mm -hmm. But the name tag, since they, they want people to use their first names, they tend to print the first name larger and the last name smaller. Ah. So I, I end up walking around with this tag that says master on it, which is, you know, and then pain in very small letters. They, they, some of the conventions are starting to fix that. They manually go in and readjust it. Yeah, it, it, is, it is an issue. What am I registered as and what is the name tag going to look like? Yes. What, a, what a strange predicament. <laughs> yeah. That's why pain works so much better. You just say pain. My name is pain. There you go. It just, then it would probably just come up in the little type at the bottom. I don't know. So how did you start coming up with your character? I know you have a number of different characters, but... Right. Well, the medieval character was the first, because, you know, up until uh, the time of the, joining the SCA, I was just doing, you know, standard magic tricks. It was a great venue for magic, uh, and they were, they were hungry for, for new entertainers at their, their feasts and events. I started to convert my tricks into medieval tricks, uh, for two reasons. One, I this was 35 years ago, and there really wasn't that much literature on period magic. You know, you had Dover's discovery of witchcraft and a and a few reproductions of other uh, magic texts from the 1600s, which I couldn't afford because I was broke at the time. Mm -hmm. And and I couldn't afford to buy new tricks. I just started to convert my existing material into more period appropriate looking material. So at the time were you doing were you doing kind of standard magic tricks ropes and oh, yeah. yeah I was doing I was doing, I'm still doing standard magic tricks. I do my medieval Renaissance sets are like cut and start rope, linking rings, egg bags, sword through neck, die box. I have a period die box where it's become a reliquary. Chinese sticks we're all way, way out there stuff, but it's all, it's all performed with a very, very medieval flavor or a Renaissance flavor more, and, and much more built around storytelling. You know, a half hour set, I do three tricks, three effects. 
That was one of the things I was going to ask you about. Your, your show is, well, it's not similar to mine. Mine's way different. But I also do, in a 45-minute show, I do five tricks. Yeah. That's it. Because yeah. there's so much setup and things. So tell me about when, when you're starting out, tell me, tell me about your process on building it up. Because I know you have 10 minutes of building it up, and then the trick happens. And it's amazing. Yeah, well, a lot of that, uh, I, was, I was very fortunate early in my career here when I moved to Seattle to hook up with uh, the Reverend Chumley, whom you may have heard of. Yep. Vaudeville artiste and extraordinaire. And, and, and the king of taking the simplest of effects and just going huge with them, you know, a 20-minute straight jacket escape or you know and and and, and so i i hang around with him for several years is so i just picked up the 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 wording and the verbiage and like the second or third magic book i got as a kid was uh, henny nelm's magic and showmanship biggest thing i took away from that was that for magic to work theatrically it has to have a why there has to be a reason you're doing this and using the things that you're using mm-hmm you just can't pick up a stock and put it around somebody's neck and shove a sword through it. You've, you've got to have a reason why you're doing this. And so that this is then explaining it and setting this up. That's how the, a four minute trick becomes a 20 minute trick. Right. Probably the best example of that is my coin and bottle, which is 20 minutes long. And I only put the coin in the bottle once. Right. And it's at the very end. It's, the- and it's at the very end. Everybody just hangs in every word I'm saying because it's, it's just this logical progression yep. of explaining the, the, the setup of the trick and then, and then I do it. I don't know if you know this or not, but I, I was watching uh, your videos of, of the coin in the bottle and, and a couple of different things that you do. And what's interesting about it, you're doing all of this setup to the trick. And I know that as I'm watching that, at some point in time, you're going to blow my mind. Now, I don't know if that's on purpose, that you do that on purpose, or if that just is part of how it all comes it's, along. It's just part of how it comes along. I always put fooling people as very low on my lists of priorities, <laughs> and mm-hmm. which sort of separates me from other magicians. You know, I, I always, you know, what, where is the entertainment value in this, this trick? And what, what's the interesting part of this trick? It, it's, it's like my multiplying bottles, I always loved the trick, but I always hated the too many bottles, too many bottles. You know, they're, they're, and there's no reason why are these things moving around, and and it, it doesn't make any sense. And they had this gorgeous set that I had lusted over for many years at the uh, local magic shop, and I finally had a event that they would have worked at. But I'm going, why would they move? What's the point? And then it just popped in my head: when you observe an event, it changes. And I went, perfect quantum mechanics. And so I use the bottles to explain the basic concepts of quantum mechanics. And now I have a routine mm. that, that's not entertaining, especially if you're an engineer, but it, it, there's a reason why everything is doing what it does. Right. It makes sense. Yeah. So that, that is usually why my, my presentations are much longer is it's just the setup to explaining why this is happening kind of naturally le- leads into making the, the routine longer. And then uh, and you don't want to lecture, then you've got to put in bits and pieces and jokes and punch it up. You just can't, can't yell at your audience for, for 20 minutes and expect them to stick around if you're not interested. Well, yeah, in that 10 minute routine, it may only be one trick, but you have, I don't know, 20 punchlines within that, that 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, tell me who, uh, I know who he is, but who is Jim Rose? Oh, geez. Jim Rose, Circus <laughs> Sideshow. <laughs> oh, yeah. So he came to town back in the 90s and I guess walked into the local magic shop and asked if there was anybody who did really, really weird stuff. And my name came up because. I did really weird stuff like linking rings, cut and restored ropes. Or, you know, I had this reputation of just being this odd magician because I talked funny and I, I, I told stories. And so yeah. he calls me up and, and I, all the, the geek, literally geek alarms go off when, he, when he's talking to me. He's just really kind of wanting to know what I do and how, I, you know, how, how he can make a buck off of me. And so it turns yeah. out he only lived what, for the time he lived a few blocks from me. So I went over to his house and saw him do face and glass. Some, I can't remember the other two things he was doing at the time, but I taught like bit him. Of, bit of nails uh, or something? 
uh, better nails, better nails and facing glass were the two things that he was doing at the time. And, okay. and just and just going through them, going, look, I put my facing glass. Look, I lay these bit of nails. I'm going, oh, my God, Chumley gets 45 minutes out of a bit of nails, and you're doing it in like six seconds. Now. But I taught him <laughs> uh, hand and trap and the human blockhead. And within a week, he was doing human blockhead with a screwdriver and bleeding all over the place. And I'm going, all right, for people who don't know what human blockhead is, explain what human blockhead is. Human blockhead is, blockhead is pounding a nail into your nose. Tom Robbins, the, the uh, Coney Island mystic geek guy, is famous for doing it, uh, as, as is Rudy Kobe. But it's, right. it's pretty gross. And I, I had learned that from Tom Ogden years and years and years ago, back when I was uh, easily influenced. So I taught him those two things. The second thing was the hand in the raccoon trap? Hand in the raccoon trap, yeah. You were, Tell us, what does that look like? You stick your hand in a raccoon trap. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I used to own a bookstore a used bookstore for a couple of years, and an, and an old Orman McGill book came in. It had the instructions to do it, and I went, "Oh, I can," you know. And I got really, really thick skin, so it doesn't bother me to do it at all. And I basically built a card trick around it. So he wanted me to be in this geek show, and I'm going, "Oh, nobody's going to come see a geek show." And he said, "Oh, you're going to come do it." So he talked me into it. So I said, "I can't be the first show. I'll come to the second show." So he spent like a week putting up flyers and. In the in the uh, cool part of Seattle called Capitol Hill, and it was going to be held at this belly dance bar and restaurant. And so, you know, wife and I are driving up to this thing, and we're driving by it, and there there there's a line, and there's people pressed up against the glass, and it, it, it's just like, oh my God, there's there's hundreds of people here. So I go in, I do do my bit in the second show. And it was just this perfect circumstance. This grunge was really big, and there were all these grunge bars and taverns and performing venues that had nothing going on on Tuesday and Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. So he just filtered right into that. And I did a few guest geek uh, uh, performances around. They then kind of bailed when they, they did their first Cross Canada tour. Wait, so Jim Rose was bringing sideshows into grunge bars? Yeah. Is that what I'm yeah. hearing? And then from there, his first big thing, he did uh, Lollapalooza. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it was, it was just this, this perfect storm of, you know, he would have, you know, because he was horrible. He, was, he, was, he really didn't know the art of how to build things up. You know, he was learning it, but it, it took a long time for him to become kind of the master of a uh, ringmaster of these people. Yeah. And then, and then uh, um, the Enigma showed up, and I'm like going, you know, and I had met him years previously. I'm sorry, who is the Enigma? The Enigma is, um, his name is Paul, really nice guy, uh, musician, taught himself how to fire, eat, and sword swallow, mm -hmm. and then decided pretty much at Tim, uh, uh, Jim Rose's urging to, to get tattooed from head to foot, first oh. in puzzle pieces, that were then slowly filled in blue. Um, he now has horns, a split tongue, m multiple piercings, and is just happy. He's just a happy, happy, happy guy. When he showed up, he wasn't, you know, he was just a normal looking guy at that when I met him. Wow. And I was sort of shocked to see him there because I, like I said, I had worked with him a few years previously in a warehouse job. And, it, uh, but you know, this, this severely changed uh, Paul's life and he became known as the Enigma. Now that you describe him, I think I've probably seen him either on Facebook or I've seen pictures or I live not far from Venice. Maybe I've seen him down there. Might have seen him down there. He was on the, uh, the X-Files uh, Jim Rose episode. Is that what it's called? Is it called the Jim Rose episode? No, I don't know. I don't remember what the episode is, but, but the, he, Jim Rose and the Enigma and I think Lifto were on the episode. Uh, they made The Simpsons at one time. You know, for, the, for the time being, they, they, they got pretty big, but... Like everything, you know, it only lasts so long. So then after that, did you start doing a lot of private events? I, I see you do a lot of libraries. What, what were you doing after that, after the sideshow thing? The, yeah, the sideshow thing was just, just sort of a little speed bump. It, it never really uh, amounted to much. What happened is I, I, I basically just sort of did Renaissance fairs and medieval fairs, and that was my, my niche market. And I, I was performing as much as I wanted to. I, know I would pick up the occasional birthday party and wedding, usually booked through uh, the, vet, the, the medieval fairs that, that I worked. They would see me there and then, then book me for other things from there. And then I went to England in mm, 1998. 
and I saw Monday Night Magic, and, I, and I'm sitting in the audience going, God, why don't we have something like this here? So I came back to Seattle and found a, a bookstore with a full-size theater stage complete with lighting and sound system that were looking for things to do. So I pitched them the show. We would do magic shows there once a month on the, uh, the third Monday, second or third Monday of the month. Developed a little bit of a following. Uh, the show's actually still running today. It's been running for 20 years. Oh. But in, a, in another bookstore now. Uh, same chain, but a different location. Are you performing in that? I usually perform there. Um, nine times out of 10, you'll see me there. It's just, it's just, it's just a, little, it's a little free show. It's a great place to, to work out new material, try stuff out. It's one of those places where you can be bad because, you know, we're not charging people anything. But we, we get, you know, 40 to 50 people that just sort of crowd into the little, this little tiny corner of the bookstore to watch us. Would you mind if I put a link to that in your show notes? No, that's fine. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's held the th- second Monday of the month at Ravenna Third Place Books in North Seattle. Oh, cool. I think we have a Facebook page for it. Um, I think if you look at Magic Mondays, you'll find our Facebook page. Okay, you know what I'll do then is I'll put the link of the Facebook page on there so someone can come see you. Yeah, ooh, yeah, that'd be great. The book starts called Third Place Books because the guy who created these wanted it to be, this is the third place you go. You go home, you go to work, this is your third place. And he's very community-oriented, uh, community so he wants you know, th- things for the community to do. So on school holidays, they traditionally have things for kids to come to. Parents don't have to worry about where their kids will be. And this was the third Harry Potter book had just come out. No, the third Harry Potter book. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, the fourth one was getting ready to come out in about six months. The frenzy was starting to build, but they didn't really quite realize how badly it was building. And they just said, well, let's have a Harry Potter-themed event. Scholastic sent them like, like 30 stickers and 30 activity books. And when they had 75 kids show up for this, they're like, well, we have more things than kid, more kids than things. We need something. So that they, I come home from vacation to find a frantic message on my answering machine, and they asked me if I could do a Harry Potter-themed magic show for this event. Mm. And I'm going, oh, geez, I haven't even read the books yet. But fortunately, my wife had. So I'm thinking, well, I can talk to her. Yeah, when do you need this for? Yeah. And they said, three days. <laughs> oh, you're like, great. And I thought about it and said, yeah, I can do that. So, I, fortunately, I, I already had the costume because we had done, my wife and I were, were, were costumers for science fiction conventions and historical costumers. So, we already had kind of a, a, an interesting wizard outfit. And so, I cobbled together like four, you know, very Harry Potter themed tricks and then just filled in with regular tricks. Yeah. By the time of the show, they had nearly 400 kids. Oh, yeah. Lots of them in costume, many of them in character, many of them interacting with you in character. Mm. I did my show, and that, that show, two librarians from the King County Library System came up and said, oh, you have to submit this for next year's reading program. And that's how I got into libraries. Oh, I see. King County Library is the second largest library system in the country. Oh. And so for a good 10 years if not more, they, they pretty much regularly book me every year for their summer reading program. And I would always try to make this show fit into the theme. So I, I have a cowboy show and a pirate show. I built a flea circus one year. I have an Edgar Allan Poe themed show, various science shows that, you know, formed from time to time. I had a mystery show. And so it was neat to do that because it just, it just got you thinking, how would I come up and, and, create magic for this. And so, you know, since I build most of my own props, because you kind of had to when you were doing Renaissance magic, mm-hmm. because you just can't buy Renaissance props. Uh, so I, I would build a you know, custom magic for these things. In these shows, are you doing standard magic tricks with yeah. a cowboy flair, po, po flair, or medieval flair, whatever it happened to be? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, most of the tricks are just variations on standard standard tricks. Uh, the Poe has a couple of... of uh, original routines that I, uh, that I developed, uh, like the cowboy shows, a large amount of just rope tricks. Mm. And I w- I'd always try to find a book to associate this with, the, like the um, cowboy show is based on the uh, 
Mr. Mysterious and company. Real quick, let's go back to that Harry Potter thing. So you're hired for this Harry Potter thing uh, for yeah. the opening of the first, um, the first movie, the first book? First, uh, it was actually uh, just a Harry Potter themed event for a bookstore. And then the, the third book, third or four, I can't remember which one it was. They all kind of run together. But they, they would have me then come back for every, every book release. So I, I never actually paid for a Harry Potter book because it was always part of my, my fee was that I would get the uh, Harry Potter book. So when people, when kids are talking to you after the show, they're talking, you have to know the Harry Potter books, oh, right? Yeah. When the library would have me doing Harry Potter, if there was a book released that year, I would drive and my wife would read the book out aloud so mm. that we would be up to date on everything. The weird thing is, you know, you have these, these kids that just had encyclopedic knowledge of every aspect of the book, every character, everything. Oh, yeah, I have to tell you, I have to interrupt you there only because when the second book came out, I went with my oldest daughter to the bookstore at midnight when it was released. Yeah. I think she read it in one day or two days. Yeah. She knew every single thing about it. So if you're going to yeah. talk with her, you better know something about it. Yeah. yeah. So then the movie started coming out. So then you'd have audiences where you, where you would have kids that had read the books and kids that saw the movies. Mm -hmm. Then as that progressed, you would just have kids that saw the movies and hadn't read the books. Now you'll be doing Harry Potter events where they've neither seen the books, read the books, nor seen the movies. So they just know Harry Potter is a wizard. Yeah. And so it's been this weird, like, right, actually, like, why do you book a Harry Potter magician if your kids know nothing about Harry Potter? Because I have all these references to Harry Potter, and then if they don't understand it, they, they don't, you know, they're, they're not going to get any of this. Yeah. It's a bit of a weird uh, transition, but we had a big Harry Potter, I'm sorry, Wizarding World convention here uh, yes. last year that went over gangbusters and all these cosplayers running around pretending to be the Weasleys and yeah. Hermione. And it was an interesting event. Hmm. But it's been good to me. I've, I've got this, you know, I've got the reputation of being the wizard school guy, in case anybody from, 20th, uh, from Warner Brothers is listening. Wizard school, no Harry Potter, wizard school theme shows. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want somebody knocking on your door. <laughs> well, Okay, so yeah, I, I'm into the thing. I wrote Scholastica letter saying I've been hi, uh, hired by a library to do these shows, you know, and they, they can't write back. They just have to ignore it. But I, uh, I put in my my two cents worth. So I said I, I'm not going to do these probably for libraries. It'll just be uh, keep it low and under the radar, and this will be fine. So I come home, and there I am in a half page photo above the fold in the entertainment section of the paper. And then there's an email waiting for me from a guy from Time Magazine uh, wanting to interview me. And I'm going, of course, Time Warner. And I'm yeah. like, going, no, I, I, no, I don't think an interview would be in my best interest. I don't, <laughs> I'm not looking to take this thing national. I'm just going to be performing locally. I don't want to be on their radar as being, oh, there's one to we'll, we'll send a cease and desist letter for. So. Boy, that's, that's a hard decision to make. It's like good news and bad news, huh? Yeah. I, I'm sort of surprised I haven't gotten a cease and desist letter yet, but huh. somebody will listen to this. <laughs> no, no, no. Hopefully, hopefully nobody, nobody in that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, you know, I do not advertise it on the web. I do not say I am Wizard Schools International. So right. I, that's how I play it up. And, and yeah, I've had different people on this podcast who do. Um, I had one woman on who does a number of the Disney characters, but she doesn't do the Disney characters. She does, for example, a mouse clown <gasps> Ooh, or a princess clown. Yeah. So she gets around it that way. And I interviewed Ace Miles. Do you know Ace Miles? I don't think so. Okay. He, he does a pirate thing very much mm. like uh, Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow, yeah. Yeah, Jack Sparrow. Yeah, Jack Sparrow. Yeah. Um, and he looks just like him, but he gets around it because his whole show is a parody of, of that. It's really fun. When I did mine, I chose the name of Professor Hieronymus Payne because I always try to work Payne into the title some way as well. I decided to go with a completely mythical character because there's no preconceived notions. And, and the basic underlying theme of the show is that I've come to give all the lucky first years their orientation and I explain the differences between the muggle and the real world mm. you know, and demonstrate a, a potions class and a, show how wands work. And, and in the end, you know, I have a whole trick that explains the rules of Quidditch. 
Ah. What I like to do with my shows, I, I call them immersion shows where, you know, I, I play a character that is believable. I'm not just doing a regular magic show and then we'll go over and we'll say Harry Potter three times. You know, that's not a Harry Potter show. A Harry Potter show is where you, you, you show up as a wizard, you act like a wizard, everything you pull out of your bag looks like something a wizard would pull out of his bag. Gotcha. That's something that, from the Renaissance Fair days. I, I, know. I want my act to look like if you were walking to the Globe Theater in the Renaissance and you came around the corner and you saw me, I wouldn't be sticking out. I don't use cards with indices on them. I try to. There's nothing plastic. There's nothing really modern looking in the show. Everything has a period feel and a period look. And that's that's what you become famous for. Yeah. All right. We're gonna move on to fact or something. John just made up. That, that sound like fun? Yeah. Is it fact Ooh. or is it something John just made up? Ah. I'm going to say a headline, and uh, you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Okay. First headline, a deer once ran through Master Payne's show. That is true. Oh, <laughs> what happened? I didn't see it, but I'm, I'm performing out at, at my, my home fair, which is this little dog and pony sh- uh, fair named Camlin out in the wilds of Carnation, which is uh, about 45 minutes east of Seattle. I turn to my left to get something out of my basket, and I hear the entire audience go, <gasps> ooh, oh. and I'm going, I haven't done anything to go ooh on. And then they say, a deer, and I guess a deer had come right out of the uh, forest, right behind me, see me, and then run off to the right. So I, I just never saw it. I never even heard the thing. But it was just like going, it was just like, okay, so how many people actually have a deer run yeah. through their show? Not, not many. I think you should have stepped forward and gone, ta-da! Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I may have done something like that, but... Uh, but it was just, it was so fast and it was like, okay, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a new one. That's a new one. No, I work in the city. That, that's probably not going to happen to me. No. <laughs> All right. Next headline. While at a cocktail party, Master Payne accidentally introduced himself to Payne Stewart. The comedy quickly ensued. Oh, no, no that's, that, that never happened. Oh, <laughs> I, unless, I have no recollection. Maybe it was the deer that distracted me. <laughs> <laughs> Payne Stewart, a famous golfer. I can just picture you two at a, at a, at a party. Pain, yeah. pain, 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 pain. All right. Next headline. Master Pain is the inspiration for a comic book superhero. Well, that's half true. Half true. Oh, I'm not really a superhero. I'm a, I'm, I am, however, a comic book character in the Hugo winning, award winning webcomic Girl Genius, where I am Master Payne and I run a circus that uh, the, the heroine of the comic takes refuge in for several, several issues. Can someone look that up and look and watch that? They can read it, yeah. It's, uh, geez, it's been running for, for years and years and years. But you just do uh, Girl Genius. I think it's girlgenius.com, and they have all the issues are online. There's a hardback novelization called uh, Girl Genius, and I think it's The Clockwork Princess that had, uh, is the novelization of my issues, which is really weird because they didn't let me write any of the mat- lines. So you're seeing me talk funny and then and then they had the 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 audio book so there's a woman reading it reading lines that i'm supposed to have said you're like oh this is just weird this is just really really weird that's weird but they're 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 good friends of ours uh draw comic books and we are the the godparents to their children so that's how my wife is in is in his mistress marie that is my wife in the circus so we are both immortalized forever in the pages of a comic book so your wife is in the comic book also as well, yeah, as well, yes. She <laughs> likes to hit people with frying pans. So between the two of you, who sneaks off and uh, reads, reads uh, the comic book behind the other one's back? Uh, she's a more avid follower of the, of the comic book than I am. But mm-hmm. I guess it's been running for years and years. And, years, and we're supposed to make a reappearance someday, they keep promising. 
but uh, so far we haven't we haven't uh, appeared again. It's set in a, a parallel universe where mad scientists rule the world shortly after the Napoleonic era, mm. and uh, magic is kind of real. If you have the spark, which is called the spark, you can build anything you want out of anything you find. And it just it just works. And I, I'm a low level spark that wow. uses the circus's cover because you don't want people to know you're a spark. Mm. But when we reappear, I want to be running a flea circus with like six foot giant fleas. I'm hoping oh. that he'll take that suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever taken that to Comic Con or been to Comic Con with that? I haven't been to Comic-Con. Uh, my wife has been to Comic-Con, the big one in San Diego, because she used to babysit our godchildren down there. Mm. We have built the entire Master Pain outfit, and I've taken it to the local Comic-Con, and I've taken it to some other costuming events. Uh, and I've been half people go, well, that's like the best Master Pain. And I'm going, well, it's because I, I am Master Pain. <laughs> You're like, I wonder why that is. And I, I did this, this, weird, this weird science fiction fantasy convention in Salt Lake, and I drug it down there. They had all these cosplayers, so I had to ask him, well, if I'm cosplaying me, is it really cosplay? Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't answer it. <laughs> all right, next one. Next headline. Last headline. Master Pain killed Dr. Lucky. That is true, depending on how you play the game. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a board game called Kill Dr. Lucky that a, a juggler friend of mine constructed. He ran his own game company for years called Cheap Ass Games. <laughs> One of the most popular games he came out with was called Kill Dr. Lucky, which is a kind of a clue variant where you're trying to go from room to room and killing uh, killing Dr. Lucky. Okay. You're trying to get in a, in a room with Dr. Lucky where nobody can see you so you can hopefully hopefully kill him by you know, having the right weapon. I wasn't in the, the original game, but I am in the revi revision of the game. And there's also a card game called Get Lucky, which I appear as a character called uh, a Studs McCracken. They sell this game now in Barnes and Noble, and so I'm on. I'm one of the characters on the cover cartoon of me, and so every Christmas people will post on my Facebook, "Is this you? How did you get in this game?" I'm going, well, they, they used to do laundry at our house when they first moved here, so we are they are forever indebted to us, and so yes, we and and both the wife and I appear in the game as well. So both the game and the comic book came completely coincidentally that they're friends of yours. Yes, well, the, the small circle of friends, yeah, they, the people that made the games introduced us to the comic book artists, but the comic book artists put us in the comic before we were put into the game by the game people, so. I see. Yeah, so, but small circle of friends. It is a small circle of friends. Influential friends, at least in their, their small, small world that we, we live in. That was Fact Ooh. or something John just made up. Ah. We're going to go on to fan questions. You want a fan question? Sure. Okay, we have one fan question. I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to read it exactly like it was put on Facebook. Owen Anderson, he's a terrific magician out of Ontario, says, I am not a spring chicken. Curious about your thinking of for keeping costuming and material age appropriate. Any advice for aging? Of course, he's talking about himself, aging gracefully as a performer. This lately becoming a concern of mine because I, I just hit 60 mm. and you, and you have to realize yeah the stuff that you did when you were uh, 20 isn't going to play as well as it, when you're 60 because you know you'll just end up looking kind of like a creepy old man yeah again it's empathy and understanding how you appear to the audience there was a, a famous magician uh known for um this card on forehead and uh, what was he doing a couple of years ago he had a, an unpleasant run-in at the magic castle where a woman just sort of it was you know again perfect storm of wrong woman wrong material wrong venue uh. it, it just blew up but then you start looking at him going, yeah you're a lot older now and society's changed the norms have changed that's true you know, things just don't play quite quite as well, and I, I know I hate to have to you know, to bow to the 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 political correct god, but there are things that you know people are 
much more sensitive to, and they have a larger soapbox to stand on. Yeah. So you kind of have to be careful. Yeah, I'm, I'm slowly, one of my signature Renaissance pieces is, is sword through neck. It could be read as being kind of abusive. So I'm, I'm sort of slowly edging it out of the show because if I don't have an audience where I know that, yes, that woman will work perfectly for this, and I could be wrong, but it's generally not, you know, I won't do it because if I, if I have to pick and kind of, I'm not real comfortable, I don't think she's going to be a good fit for this, I won't do it now. Yeah, we have to we have to change with the times as far as those things go. For example, I mean, years ago, cigarette magic was a rage. Yeah. A lot of people did a lot of cigarette magic, and now you never see it because it's inappropriate. Well, and, and, and you can't really do it. You know, they're, they're all, all the venues are no smoking. Right. You can't actually light up a cigarette on stage. Right. So um, we have to keep an eye on it and uh, keep up with the times. Yeah. And, and you, you just can't treat your female assistants as props. In a, you know, just even putting your hand on their shoulder to adjust where they're standing could be seen as inappropriate. That's right. And you don't want that one complaint to go to the person that hired you. Yeah. I mean, right after the Finney thing exploded, we had an, an issue here with a, a Teatro Zinzani where Verona, and again, Perfect Storm picked the wrong woman for the wrong trick. And, it, and she just posted on social media how she felt abused by Verona. And you're like, oh, yeah, he does the same thing twice a night for 20 years. Yeah. And no one's complained, but you just get the, the person who is agoraphobic and doesn't like to be the center of attention. And suddenly they're the center of attention. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's just, you, you got to be really, really careful these days. All right. So you, you have some advice for the beginner or the pro? The best advice is to, to you know, be self-aware, understand how you appear and, and how the audience is actually reacting. You know, you need to have empathy for your audience and, and not, not perform at them, perform with them. Mm. I see so many magicians or actually any kind of entertainer who you, you suddenly realize that it really doesn't matter if there's a hundred people in the audience or nobody that he would be doing the show exactly the same way right. for either situation. And so it just kind of comes off canned and inauthentic. But my worst shows are the shows that they separate me from the audience by a, by a gulf of numbers of feet. You know, I like to perform right up with them so I can like interact with them. Yeah. I think, I think that's important, especially magic. Magic is a more intimate type of uh, entertainment. It's difficult to do it for a thousand people and get the same kind of experience than you do for a couple hundred. Yeah. Steve Martin did famously did the disappearing dime trick for, yeah. for yeah. 20,000 people or something like that. Yeah. And that, that's why he did it because it's just like, yeah. And the date has changed. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> I run into that a lot in LA County. I'm I'm outside of LA County and I do a lot of school assemblies. For some reason, whoever de- designed the theaters at all the all the elementary schools in Los Angeles, the first row of chairs is about 50 feet back from the stage. Yeah. Kind of like there's a dance floor separating the stage and the first row of seats. And yeah. whenever I walk into that situation, I'm always like, well, here we go. We're going to do our best. And the, the second worst show I, I, I had was it was uh, for an arts festival that they called uh, Winterfest. It's held in our Seattle Center in an, in an old uh, armory building. And it's this huge cavernous thing. And the first row of seats is like 100. It's just like across the room. But not only that, then, then they have kids, of course, sitting on the floor between that and you that you can perform for. But you're on this half-hour schedule, but all the kids that are coming from, like, a daycare are on this 20-minute schedule. Oh. So you'll be performing, and then they'll just get up and leave, and then another, another group just comes back and sits in, and you're like, do I start over? <laughs> do I just... You're in the middle of your show? Or, or, or the other one we were doing, this didn't happen to me. I was at this event, but it didn't, and it, thank God it didn't happen to me. It happened to the, the act on the, the last act. It was a trade conference for, I think, North, uh, South Koreans. I think they were all South Koreans. And they brought them in on buses, and, and it was a, a, a medieval banquet that they were holding for these people. But the singing act is up and doing fine. And then suddenly, no warning, nobody said a word. The entire room just stands oh. and walks out. <laughs> 
because it's nine o'clock. The buses are here. Oh, we must go. And you're just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Just, I have never seen anything like this. It was just like, we are we are very well organized people and we will just, we, we, we must leave now. We don't care what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I run into that occasionally uh, with doing school shows because they have a recess or lunch at a particular time. Yeah. And some schools are really, really cool about it. And, and they're like, okay, well, you know, lunch is at 11.55, but if you go till 12 o'clock or 12.05, it, it's, it's totally fine. But there are the ones where half the audience gets up at 11.55 because they have to go to math class or something. Right. We've trained them to do that. It's Pavlovian. You know, the bell rings. We must go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I've taken about enough of your time. Do you have a recommended book to give us? And then we'll let you go there. Two recommended books, of course, Magic and Showmanship by Henny Nelms, which is the book that sent me off on my career. And then my book, Sometimes the Jokes Are Just for Me, uh, currently mm. available as a digital download or on, uh, at Penguin Magic. Ah. And I need at least two people to buy one because they don't give you a, a check until you make break $100, and I'm at seventy four fifty right now. So. <laughs> okay. We'll see if we can get you over that. I'm going to put that on your show notes, too. Yeah. See if we can get you over that hundred buck mark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for doing my show, Pan. That was that was really fun. Yeah, I had a great time. I also do conventions. Book me for your magic convention. I do lectures. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, real quick. You know, the first time I ever, uh, before I let you go, first time I ever saw you was, I think it was on Facebook. I think I saw one of your lectures talking about the magic castle. It was terrific. Yeah. Expectations. Yeah. It actually got a standing ovation at Magic Live when I did it. It was very strange. That's right. That was at Magic Live. I didn't know that. Under a standing ovation, I'm going, I, got a, I just got a standing ovation for a PowerPoint presentation. And that's the sad thing. I'm known more for my PowerPoint presentations than I am for my, for my Magic at Magic Live. Shows the power of the pain. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Do you have any social media or anything else you'd like to promote? Uh, you, know, you can get me on Facebook with my real name, Payne Fifield, because they, they nixed my Master Payne page because it wasn't my legal name. Uh. Yeah. And, and there's the Master, I think Payne's Magics or Master Payne Magic at, at uh, 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 YouTube. I, I don't post a lot. There may be months between postings, but I, when I have something interesting, I, I will put it up. All right. We'll let you go. That was super fun, Payne. Okay. Thank you. Special thanks to all my listeners. Make sure to leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to this. And if you have a couple of minutes, leave a nice review. I'll read them every few weeks and give you a shout out on the air here. If you found this podcast valuable, share it with your friends on your social media. You can reach me at john at thevarietyartist.com or you can join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. <laughs>